This month of March, we've considered a few of the heroes of the faith told to us through the pages of God's Word. Last week, we considered one of the Bible's most obvious heroes as we examined the story of David and Goliath before the Lord God, the giant Goliath, lost again. Today we consider one of the Bible's most unlikely heroes as we examine the story of Jonah. Now if you've watched any of the heroes of the Marvel comic movies, Iron Man, Captain America, heroes run toward danger. Batman and Superwoman speed to face the foe and to battle the enemy. That makes Jonah more of a non-hero than it does a hero. We know the story well. And we know that Jonah does not speed to face the foe. How surprising that God's word would even include a story such as this, because it tells the story of one of God's prophets ignoring God's call and running in the opposite direction. But then the story really isn't about Jonah. But that's the person that we remember the most from this story, isn't it? Yet this Bible story is like every other Bible story. The story is about God. The story of Jonah begins and ends with the Lord God. His is the first word in the story, and the Lord God also has the last word in the story. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, when that word of the Lord came to Jonah, We don't know what Jonah was doing. We know that he is the Lord's prophet, but what else outside of that Jonah might have done, we simply do not know. 2 Kings 14 identifies Jonah as the son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath-Hefer. The town of Gath-Hefer is in Zebulun, one of the tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel. But scripture beyond that does not identify much about the prophet Jonah. So we don't know what he might have been doing when the call of the Lord came to him. But scripture does tell us what the Lord God himself is doing. God shakes up our comfortable life. That's our first note this morning. Whatever Jonah may have been doing throughout the day, the Lord shakes up his comfortable life and says, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Has your comfortable life been shaken up during this past month? Mine? certainly has. My comfortable life had a regular schedule. When are we looking after the grandkids this week? And what's for supper? How many more days and weeks to get through this Lenten season? And how am I going to manage the Holy Week and Easter services? Looking back three or four weeks, how routine and ordinary and comfortable our living seemed compared to right now. But life has a way of changing our plans. The Lord God has a way of changing our plans. God shakes up our comfortable life. Sometimes the maker of heaven and earth uses a hurricane or a flood to unsettle our comfortable life. 
Sometimes the great physician and healer of all uses a virus to shift our life from us, 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 or me, 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 to a greater concern for our neighbors, whether they are near to us or whether they are on the other side of the world. How humbling that something our naked eye cannot even see causes so many of us to scurry and panic. When the word of the Lord comes simply to the prophet Jonah, Jonah's life is shaken. His comfortable life quickly disappears. And just as quickly, Jonah, the prophet of the Lord, becomes Jonah, the stubborn prophet. Note number two for us today, Jonah pursues his own solution. The Lord's intent is met with Jonah's resistance, and that's just an all too familiar story. The Lord God says, do not eat, but the man and the first man and the first woman cannot resist how good that fruit looks to the eye. They disobey, and they eat from the tree. They follow their own desires, behaving opposite to what the Lord God instructs. And when the Lord God comes into the garden, Adam and Eve hide themselves. When the Lord God promises Abraham and Sarah they will be parents and have a son, one through whom God's covenant and his blessing would continue, they cannot wait for the Lord to bring his fulfillment. But after waiting for a while, they can wait no longer. They seek their own solution. Sarah offers her maid to bear the child of Abraham. Jonah here responds as we most often do. I know how to deal with this. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Restrictions grow tighter and tighter in our communities, during this national health emergency because our human nature does not like to follow instructions. The first step to doing well on any test is to follow the instructions. Just ask any teacher. But we human beings do not follow instructions well. Our sinful nature leads us to follow our own solution. You know better, that little voice keeps telling us, why should you listen to what they're telling you to do? Jonah knows better, and so he pursues his own solution. The Lord tells Jonah to go to Nineveh, the capital home of Israel's enemies, the Assyrians. In the generation after Jonah, the Assyrian soldiers will come and stomp on Israel's capital, Samaria, and carry all of her people off into exile. So that in his stubbornness and knowing better, Jonah says, no, I'm not going that direction. I'm getting as far away from here and from Nineveh as possible. And so Jonah boards a ship, and he heads in the opposite direction to flee from the Lord. Now, if there is one thing that we can learn from this story, it's this. You cannot flee from the Lord. The Ninevites cannot flee from the Lord. The Lord's people in Israel cannot flee from the Lord. The Lord's prophet Jonah cannot flee from the Lord. I cannot 
flee from the Lord. You cannot flee from the Lord. You think you can run fast, and you very well may be able to run faster than I can run, but none of us can run away from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Jonah runs below deck, but he cannot flee. The threatened soldiers, the threatened sailors come to find Jonah. We all feel threatened by the storm of this virus that is sweeping across the world. Its waves seem to be everywhere. There is no place to go. There is no place to hide. We feel rather vulnerable, even very mortal. But the question is not, where can I go to escape this storm? Rather, for us, the question needs to be, to whom can I go in the midst of this storm? In faith, we go to the Lord. Note number three for us today, receiving time to reflect and pray. The Lord who had called Jonah to go to Nineveh now provides Jonah with a course correction. The Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. As I said earlier, I enjoy fishing when I get the opportunity. The fisherman baits the hook and endeavors to catch the fish. The fish here, though, catches Jonah. Left by himself out there in the middle of the Mediterranean, Jonah will drown. The Lord rescues Jonah. The Lord provides a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And what's the first thing that Jonah does inside the fish? From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Now we have no record of Jonah praying to the Lord when the Lord calls him to go to Nineveh. We have no record of Jonah praying in the midst of the storm, even when the captain of the ship comes and pleads with him, call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. Now though, inside the fish, Jonah prays. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. With regret and repentance, in faith and in trust, Jonah prays to the Lord. Our Christian time of Lent is a time for extra reflection upon our walk and upon our life's journey with the Lord. We consider the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus, and why he journeys to Calvary and lays down there his life as a sacrifice. Jonah falls short of listening to the Lord. But then, so do we all. The one called Jesus, though, listens to his heavenly Father because we choose not to listen. He lays down his life for us because we cannot now or ever pay the debt of our transgressions and sins. Lent is meant to be a specific time, even some extra time in the midst of the church's seasons for contrition and repentance as we seek the Lord. The final words of Jonah's prayer says, Salvation comes from the Lord. And it's a prayer that our Lord always hears. Vomited up on the land, the Lord God comes a second time to Jonah. Go to the great city of Nineveh. Our God is the God of a second chance, or a third chance, or even a fourth chance, if that's how many we need. He does that for Jonah, and he does that for all 
of us. The Assyrians of Nineveh, even the very enemies of God's people, receive another chance. For the Lord's prophets, this time, brings the Lord's message to them. And so our final note reminds us today, God's love and mercy are for all. Imagine with me for just a moment. You are entering heaven, and there you are greeted by the executioner of the apostle Paul, who came to faith later in life. Suppose Joseph Stalin had repented and come to faith in Jesus Christ as he lay there on his deathbed. Would you rejoice in seeing him in heaven? What if, as you are seated at heaven's banquet table, you come to know that the person next to you is the one who initiated this pandemic that is destroying life around the world? Would you ask for a new seat? We look at Jonah, and we easily see his lovelessness and judgmentalism. We see also how the older brother in Jesus' parable responds to the father, won't even go in to the celebration that his brothers has returned. Yet we are reluctant to admit ourselves that we find it much easier to receive the things of the father rather than to connect with our father's heart. And then we look around at our neighbors, eager to point out their wrongs, their shortcomings, their sins, while we minimize our own. The Lord our God shows patience with Jonah as he acts in love and mercy for us all. He acts in love and mercy toward his stubborn prophet. He acts with that same love and mercy toward the Ninevites. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. In Jesus' parable of the lost sons, it's that older brother who becomes angry when the father receives the younger son back into the family with joy and with celebration. Well, here, Jonah grows angry when God does not destroy Jonah's enemies. But God's love and mercy are for all. Jesus points to Jonah as that one who was three days in the belly of the fish, And as he does so, he reminds us that the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And after three days, wrapped in death, God raises his Son. Jesus brings to us this new life of God's mercy and grace and forgiveness. It's in his life, his death, his resurrection that we all receive that which God would offer to the world in his love. Mercy, compassion, grace, the forgiveness of God our Father. Thank God that he is gracious and compassionate to us. While we blame and we judge, and even at times we hate, our Savior lives for us. He dies for us, he loves us, and he embraces us with his new life. Our Savior calls us to repentance just as he did Jonah, just as he did the Ninevites. God's mercy, God's grace belongs to you through Christ's cross. God's forgiveness, that same grace and mercy belongs to all persons through Christ's cross. Beneath Christ's cross, receive them again this day. And in Christ's precious name, amen.